States a number of years ago. This is my first visit uh, to Sydney, Robin. I'm sorry to say it's taken me so long to get here. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Uh, when I was invited to participate in the meeting, and I checked the I checked the theme of the meeting and saw that uh, the title was Be Active. So I wanted to uh, develop a talk that would have the broadest appeal possible <coughs> to the audience. And so as Andy mentioned, what I've done is I've collected some observations, uh, most of which are recent, that have to do with the general topic of physical activity. And as Andy said, uh, this is the first time I've ever given this talk. So if it's a little rough in place, please forgive me as I work my way through this. So it's common experience that, to us that <coughs> performance capabilities decline uh, across the lifespan. Span. And the magnitude of these declines, uh, independent of levels of physical activity, can be characterized by considering uh, various world performance for different events. So here what we have are uh, average speeds during, uh, uh, for world record performances at different age groups and the event is five kilometers, 5,000 meter race. So these data are for men in the top and uh, women on the bottom. And the main point of this slide is to emphasize that despite maintaining relatively high levels of physical activity, performance capabilities decline with age. Uh, we also know from the literature that performance capabilities are strongly associated with daily levels of physical activity. And moreover, that declines in physical activity across the lifespan have consequences for health and well-being. So to minimize reductions in habitual levels of physical activity, it seems to me obvious that we need to understand how performance performance capabilities change from childhood to senescence. And so what I would like to do today is I've chosen three topics that will hopefully appeal to many of you to describe how these performance capabilities change across the lifespan. So I will first share with you some recent data that we have obtained on sex differences and performance capabilities <coughs> during uh, puberty. <coughs> Secondly, I will talk about strength dexterity <coughs> divergence in middle age, and thirdly, I will talk about preserving function during senescence. So I'm sure we are all aware that physical activity levels decline during childhood and uh, adolescence. This decrease is of concern because the prevalence and magnitude of obesity among children is associated with the decline in the habitual level of physical activity. The reduction in daily levels of physical activity during puberty is greater for girls than boys, which likely contributes to the greater prevalence of high BMI values among girls. And these observations can be characterized with this data set here uh, that was recently published that showed estimated levels of physical activity as derived from a questionnaire in boys the open circles and girls as a function of chronological age. And what these data indicate is that for both sexes, the habitual levels of the estimated levels of physical activity decline, but the decline appears to occur earlier for girls compared with boys. A recent meta-analysis by Craig's et al. concluded that psychosocial and environmental factors explain less than 20% of the decline in physical activity during adolescence. They also concluded that there is a significant role for biological processes that control energy expenditure and development. And the importance or the influence of biological factors can be demonstrated by normalizing the changes in physical activity to an index uh, of maturation. And a classic approach as shown, illustrated here in the work from Tanner, uh, shows how the rate of change in height differs for boys and girls. So the data on the uh, left here are for six girls, and on the y-axis is height gain, or the rate of change in height, as a function of chronological age, and the panel on the right shows a similar uh, distribution for eight boys. 
And the peak in both graph refers, often referred to as the peak height velocity, and it's used as an index of maturation. So if we take such an index and we plot the data I just shared with you about changes in physical activity, and we normalize it this way, so now on the y-axis the data or the physical activity score is expressed relative to peak height velocity, we see there is no obvious sex difference in the rate of change in physical activity levels for boys in the open circle and girls in the uh, filled circle. Uh, the rate of decline in physical activity during puberty was similar for boys and girls when expressed relative to this biological marker of maturation, this peak height velocity. And this conclusion uh, that suggests that sex differences in neuromuscular development, which are substantial, should not contribute to the decrease in physical activity exhibited by boys and girls. And as an example of how different uh, the neuromuscular development is, I share with you some data from Neville and colleagues, which show estimated strength values for the knee extensor muscles for boys in the open circles and girls in the filled circles as a function of peak height velocity. So you see that for both sexes, they both got stronger as they matured, but the rate of increase in strength was much more substantial for the boys than it was for the girls. And similarly, for a similar data set for the strength of the elbow flexor muscles, you can see that the rate of the estimated rate of increase in strength from these longitudinal data was greater for the boys than it was for the girls. So this begs the question then, numerous studies have shown that the habitual levels of physical activity decline during childhood and adolescence, and if it's not due to differences in the development of the neuromuscular system, how can we explain this? So we did a cross-sectional study uh, of 72 healthy children, 39 boys and 33 girls, aged 8 to 14 years, and we compared sex differences in anthropometric and motor performance characteristics at three TANF stages as defined by a an evaluation by a physician. The outcome variables included DEXA measurements of body composition, assessments of neuromuscular function, and physical activity levels as measured by accelerometry with an actograph. As an example of some of our, uh, physical, uh, of our uh, physical function measurements, this shows a boy performing uh, a strength test uh, for the knee extensor muscles. So he was asked to contract his muscles and push his leg upward. That was one test. And he also tested the strength of the knee flexor muscles in a similar position. We also measured the endurance of the knee extensor muscles with this wall squat exercise. So with the knee at a right angle, uh, the children were asked to stay in this position for as long as possible. We measured the fatigability of the elbow flexor muscles. They were supporting a submaximal load. And on a monitor, they had a, a display of the elbow angle. And their task was to sustain that elbow angle for as long as possible. In addition, we tested uh, manual dexterity by having the children complete this test of, dex of uh, the group backboard. If you're not familiar with this test, uh, there are 25 holes in the board and uh, more than 25 pegs, and they have a keyhole shape, and the object is to take one peg at a time, orient it correctly, and place it in the hole, get another peg, and so on, and do this as quickly as possible. So the data for the children are shown here. So we had, again, these are cross-sectional data, boys and girls at T1, 17 boys, 13 girls, boys, 10 boys at T2, 10 girls at T2, 12 boys at T3, and 10 girls at T3. Um, the boys and girls uh, were older, taller, and had a greater body mass at T3 compared with T1. Uh, there were no significant changes in BMI. The most important set of data uh, in this uh, table is the bottom row here, which is the measurement of physical activity, the estimated number of steps per day. And what you see at T1, there was no sex difference in the number of steps to the, per day. At T2 and T3, there was a sex difference that did emerge. And if you look at the data, you see that the number of steps per day across these three groups of boys increased from T1 to T3, 
Whereas the opposite change was observed with the girls, the number of steps per day decreased. So what we weren't really interested in the study is, from the outcome measures, can we explain the sex difference in the number of steps per day? So the first set of data have to do with anthropometric measurements. Uh, so we have a measurement of percentage fat, lean tissue, several segment lengths, tibia, femur, humerus, forearm, and bioact width. Um, and there are no sex differences in any of the variables except for percentage body fat. So from these anthropometric measurements obtained from DEXA scans, the girls at a higher percentage, T2 and 3, uh, T3, had a higher percentage of body fat compared with the boys at the same Tanner stage. In terms of strength, again, we have measurements for the boys and girls at the three Tanner stages. We have a hand grip strength measurement, over flexors, deflexors, and the extensors. Uh, as you would expect, the boys and girls at T3 were stronger than those at T1. Uh, but most importantly for the present purpose was that the boys were stronger than the girls at T2 and T3 for all measurements of strength, all measurements of strength. So then finally, what about these physical outcome measures? So we had these four measures. We had elbow flex endurance, the wall squat endurance, the test of manual dexterity, and the chair rise time. And what you see is that uh, there were sex differences in elbow flexor endurance at T2 and T3, also in wall squat endurance at T2 and T3. No differences in manual dexterity across these three TAN stages. But in chair rise time, again, the boys were quicker than the girls at T2 and T3. So we took these outcome variables and did a stepwise multiple regression analysis with the purpose of trying to explain the sex difference in the uh, physical activity level as indicated by steps per day at these three uh, TANA stages. And here is the data set from the first, uh, first analysis. So these are the data from T1. And what you see is for the boys in the open circles and the girls in the filled circles, the multiple regression coefficient was 0.89 for the boys and 0.96 for the girls, which is not a bad fit. And the significant variables were knee extensor strength and wall squat for the boys, and knee flexor and knee extensor strength for the girls. Similar association was found at, two t at T2. So again, the correlations were strong, 0.9 for the boys and 0.85 for the girls. And the predictive variables, the significant predictive variables, with a wall squat for both the boys and the girls, and knee flexor strength uh, for the boys. And at T3, we again have strong predictions, 0.82 for the boys, 0.96 for the girls, and the predicted variables <coughs> for a wall squat for the boys, knee flexor strength for the girls, and percentage body fat for the girls. So in comparison, this slide is interesting because what it shows from these cross-sectional data is that at T1, uh, the boys, the observed and predicted number of steps per day, there was complete overlap between the boys and girls. Before puberty, there were no differences in the amount of physical activity. By the time they had reached stage, reached stage three, which is midway through puberty, you can see that the two sexes had segregated quite strongly. The boys, the data for the boys are all up here, and the data for the girls are down here. So this brings us back to this question here, which was these observations that if you normalize estimated levels of physical activity relative to an index of uh, maturity, the peak height velocity here, there's no obvious difference between boys and girls. So how can we explain this difference in the uh, significant predictive variables from the cross-sectional study? Well, it turns out if you look at the data in the literature very carefully, there's a disconnect between the two indices of maturation. So on the top, I'm showing a scheme representing the girls, and on the bottom is a scheme for the boys. So the thick solid line is an estimate that's my cartoon drawing of the peak height velocity. And you can see that in this scheme, it occurs at about 11 and a half for girls, whereas it occurs at about 13 and a half years for the boys. But when we relate 
the uh, canner stages to chronological age, you can see that peak light velocity occurs at canner stage three for the girls, whereas it's closer to canner stage four for the boys. So these cross-sectional data on changes in physical activity relative to canner stage contrast with the longitudinal observations when the changes were expressed relative to peak height velocity. <coughs> the decrease in daily levels of physical activity across the first three canner stages was less for girls who had more strength and endurance for leg muscles and less body mass, body fat, excuse me. The increase in daily levels of physical activity across the first three standard stages was greater for boys who had more strength and endurance for the leg muscles. So that's the first story that I wanted to share with you today. And now I want to go on to the second one and talk to you uh, about strength and the divergence between strength and de dexterity uh, in middle age. The National Institutes of Health in the USA has developed a toolbox to assess neurological behavioral function in individuals aged eight, uh, 3 to 85. The toolbox comprises four domains. Cognition, emotion, motor, and sensation. The motor domain assesses the ability to perform physical tasks with tests of balance, dexterity, endurance, locomotion, and strength. Dexterity is quantified with the pegboard test and strength with the hand grip test. In a cross-sectional study of 75 adults aged 18 to 90, 89 years, 45 of whom were women, we separated them into three groups, young, middle-aged, and old. We performed tests to assess strength, steadiness, and function of the dominant and non-dominant hands. Strength, strength was measured for index finger abduction, precision pinch, and hand grip. Steadiness was quantified as the force fluctuations during sudden maximal contractions with index finger abduction and pinch. And the function of these uh, 75 adults was characterized with the pegboard test, the game operation, a star cutout test, and Archimedes spirals. And here's an example of these various tests that we performed. So measurements of index finger abduction were uh, made with the hand in this position, and the subjects were asked to push sideways with the index finger to exert an abduction force. We measured the strength of that task and also how steadily the subjects could perform it. We did the same measurements with this pinch test. The subjects were asked to pinch between the thumb and the index finger as hard as possible and also to perform a steady contraction. Our functional tests again included the pair board test, and yes, we used the game operation where subjects were asked to extract little plastic pieces, and then we had a score system um, that only a committed graduate student would be willing to carry out. They also did a star cutout test where there were a pair of lines, and they were asked to draw a cut with a pair of scissors between the lines without crossing either line. And then we used a test, oops, that, sorry. Then we used a test that's often used in neurology, which is to ask uh, subjects to draw Archimedes spirals, trace them, excuse me, without lifting the hand off the piece of paper. And we had a very rigorous uh, way to quantify the deviations of the drawn line from the uh, um, template. So the characteristics of the subjects were as possible, as following. 25 subjects in each group, age differed, no difference in height, no difference in mass. In terms of strength, we have three measures of strength, grip strength, pinch, pinch strength, uh, first dorsal osseous or uh, index finger strength, two measures of steadiness, and then the manual dexterity test. So the key findings on this table are that the old adults were weaker for all three measures than the young adults. The middle-aged adults were not statistically different in terms of the strength measures relative to the young adults. Similarly, for the steadiness measurements, the old adults were less steady than the young adults for both measures of steadiness, but also less steady than the middle-aged adults. 
And finally, and most importantly for this current study, was that the time to complete the test of manual dexterity, the paired broadcast, was significantly longer for middle-aged subjects and significantly longer than old subjects relative to young subjects, and the old subjects also relative to middle-aged subjects. So what we were interested in with our outcome measures is what were the predictive variables for this difference in the test of manual dexterity, which the NIH toolbox has concluded is a fundamental measurement of changes in uh, functional performance across the lifespan. So the data comprise 75 adults aged 19 to 89 years. The time to complete the task <coughs> spanned from 46 to 145 seconds. There's significant correlations between this time to complete the test were with grip strength, pinch strength, index finger strength, pinch steadiness, and index finger steadiness. Where we did a multiple regression analysis to predict the uh, manual dexterity time, two of these variables only, were only necessary to predict the uh, variance of the the R squared value was 0.36, which is a moderate predictor, and the two predictions, uh, pre uh, predictor variables that we identified were grip strength and index finger steadiness. So this means that those individuals who had longer times had weaker grip strength and were less steady with the index finger, just the index finger, no other measure. So these data suggest that the hand strength of middle-aged adults was not statistically different from that of young adults, but the time to complete the test of manual dexterity was longer for middle-aged adults, adults than young adults. And the longer paired board times were associated with worse index finger steadiness and weaker hand grip strength. And at this point, I would like to draw your attention to this measurement of steadiness. I would like to say a few things about measurements of steadiness as an index of muscle activation quality. And from these data, we want to conclude that the divergence in dexterity and strength measures for the middle-aged adults suggests that the quality of the muscle activation signal declines before muscle strength. So let me explain in a little bit more detail what do I mean by muscle quality and how might steadiness relate to the sum, provide us an index of this. So we define steadiness as the fluctuations in force despite an attempt to exert constant force. So I have two examples from, for you here. One data set from the hand muscle and one data set from the knee extensor muscle. In the first data set, the subjects were asked to push the index finger sideways to four different target forces, 5%, 20%, 35%, and 50%. And they were trying very hard to keep the force as constant as possible. This is what we mean by steady contraction. But despite that, you can see in the force records that the force is bouncing around. So we can quantify how much the force bounces around by taking the standard deviation relative to the average value and use the standard deviation as an index of steadiness. And this is shown for you for the knee extensor muscles in the graph on the right. So this is on the y-axis is the standard deviation of force, which is an index of steadiness. And you see that as the target force increases, so does the standard deviation of force, meaning the stronger the contraction, the less steady it becomes. And when we compare how old adults uh, steadiness compare with young adults, we can do this by normalizing the standard deviation of force because there are differences in strength between young and old. We normalize it by expressing it as the coefficient of variation. And now the measurement, the normalized measurement of steadiness, the CD for force, is greatest at low forces and it decreases as the target force increases. But the most important point in this graph is the line on the top with the filled circles are measurements for old adults and the, both the open circles are those for young adults. And in this data set at all target forces, the measurement of steadiness 
was statistically different from that for the, for the old adults relative to the young adults. We can also measure steadiness during uh, movements or dynamic actions. For example, when we've done these kinds of measurements, we place a subject in the dynamometer, <coughs> uh, the legs are attached to a lever arm, they're asked to contract the knee, extensor the muscles to raise the legs and lift the weight stack. And what you don't see is that we measure the knee angle and what they're looking at at the monitor here is a template, a triangular template, and they're asked to change knee angle to match the template as closely as possible. And when they do that, here are some typical examples for an older subject and a young person. So the dashed line is the template, and the solid line is the actual change in knee angle. And the point of this uh, typical data is to indicate that on average, Old adults have a greater difficulty with matching the template compared uh, with young adults. So what are the functional consequences of differences in steadiness? Well, there are huge consequences when we think about the accuracy of a, of a physical task. Here's an example. In this task here, the subjects were asked to perform a very rapid contraction. Notice time down the calibration is 200 milliseconds, and they were asked to match with the solid line, the, which is the force that's being exerted by the leg, to the dash line. And then the measurement, the outcome variable, was the area of under the solid line, which is the integral of the force time curve. And down below shows the area measurement for 40 performances of this task. And you can see that the area varies somewhat from one trial to another trial. And this is known as trial to trial variability. This is the performance of a young adult. Now, if we have old adults do the same task, you can see from this data set that there is much greater trial to trial variability when they perform these kinds of actions. And this variability is due to differences in steadiness. This means that as a person becomes less steady each time they perform the task, the probability of them performing it accurately declines as a function of steadiness. Moreover, steadiness influences the way in which uh, old adults, the forces that old adults exert when they are handling objects with their hands. So in this exercise here, what you can see is a person pinching between the thumb and index finger, a force transducer, and the task was simply hold the force transducer as lightly as possible, but don't drop it. Don't drop it. And here are some data for a young adult in the light gray and an old adult in the dark gray. And if we measure the slip force, and the slip force is how hard do they have to pinch before the object will fall, you can see that the slip force is a little bit different for young and old adults in, in, this, in these data set. And this difference is largely due to changes in the properties of the skin as we get older. But most importantly, the force that's actually used, the grip force, is much greater for the old adults. And the reasonable question is why? Well, if you look at the force record, they're trying to hold this object steadily, but you can see the force is bouncing around much more. So the greater the force is fluctuating, in other words, the less the steadiness, the higher that force has to be above the slip force in order to prevent it from falling. So it seems to us that steadiness has some very significant functional consequences or changes in steadiness across the lifespan. So in our study where we did this uh, cross-sectional uh, to explore this further, we did a cross-sectional study of 36 adults, uh, 19 to 86. Again, we classified them into three age groups. All of these subjects had a moderate level of anxiety. And this, the state scored a values greater than 30 on the trait component of the state trait anxiety inventory. They then came to the laboratory and performed a 70-minute protocol to assess the influence of a stressor which was electric shock, on steadiness of the pinch grip with the right hand. The uh, trains of noxious electrical stimulation in the 
range of 90 to 120 volts above the twitch threshold were applied to the dorsal surface of the left hand, and they were not pleasant. The performance criteria of data for the subjects, the three groups, we had 14 young, 10 middle-aged, and 12 old. Uh, there were differences in age, of course, no differences in height, mass, anxiety score, and no differences in strength for this cohort. So pinch strength uh, was statistically similar for, the, similar for the three groups. And the protocol looked like this. The 70-minute protocol was divided into three parts a 30-minute anticipatory uh, component, 15 minutes of exposure to the stressor, and 25 minutes of recovery. In each of the three phases, we made various measurements of anxiety, <coughs> analog scale estimation of arousal, we measured pinch grip steadiness, and we took some blood sample to measure uh, plasma levels of various stress hormones. Uh, the stressor, uh, they had three bouts of the stressor, uh, each of them lasting two minutes where the lights were either turned on or turned off for 20 seconds and when they were turned off, there was a high probability you were going to get one of these shots. So the protocol did what it was expected to do. It increased the level of arousal in our subjects. So here is the arousal score as quantified with the VAS during the anticipatory, anticipatory phase, the stressor phase, and the recovery phase. And these two data sets, the dark <coughs> circle, uh, circles are for women, and the light gray circles are for the men. The women exhibit a statistically greater change in the level of arousal, which is, was, um, which is consistent with other observations in the literature. Um, the subjects were asked during these three phases to hold that transducer that you saw in a previous uh, slide, and to hold it with the same force. And they did that because here you see is the average force being applied to the force transducer, and it does not change across the three phases. However, the measurement of steadiness, as indicated on the right axis, uh, steadiness got worse, or the standard deviation of force increased during the stress phase. So when the subjects were stressed, their steadiness declined. And here are the data for the three age groups young adults, middle-aged adults, and old adults during the three phases. So first of all, during the anticipatory phase, the old adults were statistically less steady than the young adults. Uh, during the recovery phase, there was no statistical difference, but the interesting observation is look what happens during the stress phase. These subjects had the same amount of stress, had the same amount of strength, this is the measurement of steadiness. This is how much steadiness changed for the young adults, but for the old adults, the change in steadiness was huge. So back to our uh, observation here, that changes in manual dexterity across the lifespan were associated with these two variables, grip strength and index finger uh, steadiness. And we think this is uh, going to turn out to be a reasonable surrogate uh, of muscle activation quality and how this can change across the lifespan. So to conclude from these observations, performance on a test of manual dexterity declined for middle-aged adults before there was a decrease in the strength of the hand muscles. The divergence in the dexterity and strength measures for middle-aged adults suggests that the quality of the muscle activation signal declines before muscle strength. Thirdly, the measurement of force steadiness provides one index of the quality of a muscle activation signal. So that's my second story for today, and now I would like to turn to the third and final one, which is some observations on preserving function during senescence. Um, and I'm going to begin by telling you about some observations in which we have done steadiness training. Given that changes in steadiness with advancing age do seem to have some functional significance, if we do steadiness training, does this influence muscle strength? But much more importantly, how does this influence our performance on functional tasks? So in this first study I want to tell you about, it was through 21 subjects, and they were assigned to either a steadiness training group or a control group 
for 16 weeks of, knee, of training the knee extensor muscles. And we've seen this figure before, so the subjects were seated in the same device, and they've been studying this training by matching the change in angle um, to the template that was shown on the, on the monitor. The subjects train three times a week with three sets of 10 repetitions, and the load was 30% of 1RM. It's not maximum, it's not high intensity, it's a load that will uh, enable the subjects to focus on performing steady contractions. Each leg was trained independently to perform steady contractions. And these are what the data look like. So this is the change in the angle as the subject lifted the load, and the decrease in the angle as the, as the load was lowered, here is the surface EMG activity in one of the agonist muscles, and here's the EMG in an antagonist muscle. And we measured steadiness. This is the force that the ankle or the lower leg was applying to the, the lever arm of the dynamometer. So this is the force being transmitted by the leg to the device. And we estimate, we measured steadiness by uh, determining the standard deviations of these force fluctuations about a line of gas fit through the data. And what we found after these 16 weeks of three times a week steadiness training was that there was a moderate increase in strength for the training group relative to the control group. Um, in, when strength is measured as the uh, maximum force during an isometric contraction, so the increases were around 5% maximum. And there was also an increase in the maximum load that could be lifted once, or the 1RM load, and this was in the range of 5 to 10 percent for the training group. <coughs> As we would ex expect, the subjects improved steadiness. So here's a measurement of steadiness. This is the normalized steadiness coefficient of force of the training group and the control group during the shortening contraction when lifting the load and the lower lengthening contraction when lowering the load. And for both uh, phases of the action, steadiness improved in the training group. So this is good. We uh, elicited the adaptations that we wanted, but what we were really interested in, how did this influence function? So we did three physical function tests. We did usual and fastest gate speed over 10 meters. We did the chair rise test five times. We did the stair ascent and descent on 16 steps. And the, then we calculated a composite physical function score uh, as a, a measured in seconds. And these are the results. These are the data for week one, week eight, week, six, week 16, for the training group, the control group, and the full group, and there was no functional significance. The improvement in steadiness had no influence on the ability of these uh, old adults to perform these tasks. This was rather disappointing, as you might imagine, so we went into hiding for several years and managed to connect up with another group who came up with a much more clever way to do uh, steadiness training. So let me explain this technique for you, as I suspect that most of you have not heard about this. And one way for me to explain it is relative to the exercise called the lateral pull-down. I'm sure you're familiar with the lateral pull-down exercise. So the task here, if you're not, is for the subject to contract back muscles and shoulder muscles, pull the arms down, and so pulling the arm down, the lift will raise the weight to some value, and then lower it down very carefully. And in this project, uh, the force, the position, the kinematics of the bar at this location was determined, and the force transmitted by the subject through the cable to the weight stack was measured by a force transducer based right there. Now the performance on these conventional weight training devices was compared with a set of devices that's been developed by a very clever person named Koyama. And Koyama has basically developed uh, weightlifting machines that expand the range of motion that are used during simple activities like this. So his lat pull down machine looks like this. So let me walk you through this very carefully what he's done. So once again, the subject is going to hold onto a handle, exert a pulling force here, and in so doing, raise or load. But the force that's transmitted to the load here has to pass through a secretive 
media system uh, that this pattern has been submitted for this, but it's not yet available, that manipulates how the load changes over the range of motion, and I'll show you something about that in a moment. So this gear system that Koyama has developed is very unique. There's nothing like it anywhere else that I've ever seen. But in addition to the gear system, it's the actions that the subject has to perform that are also very special. So if we go back to the lat pull-down exercise, you know pulling down on the hands, the arms move more or less in a frontal plane. So that action is pretty straightforward. So in Koyama's machine, uh, the gear system and the handles move up and down here, just as the weight stack does on the conventional machine. But in addition, the gear system rotates about this axis here, and the rotation of the gear system around this axis provides internal and external rotation about the shoulder joint. So that's an additional degree of freedom. Furthermore, the handles here can rotate about this axis, so the forearms can do pronation and supination. So he's taken a relatively simple movement and added two other degrees of freedom to it. Um, and he's called this technique beginning movement load training, which as I understand in Japanese has a very special meaning, but unfortunately when it's translated to English, it becomes a little bit obscure as to why he used that term. So hopefully I can explain that in a moment. So I have two videos to share with you so you can see the difference between them. So here is the standard lat pull-down machine. This is in Koyama's personal laboratory, I might add. Um, so they're measuring uh, the kinematics, uh, measuring EMG signals, the subject is performing this action. Now look at Koyama's beginning movement load training machine. Essentially the same action, lifting and lowering the weight stack, but look at all the, all the additional degrees of freedom here. And I would like to point out to you one very important com component of Koyama's uh, training program is this rotation about the forearm. So the subject, if you look very carefully, you can see he's pronating and supinating about the forearm, which is performing a twisting action about the long axis of the, the limb. And all his exercises have this twisting action, which he calls the dodge movement. So I've been on several of these machines, and they, they feel very different to conventional weight lifting machines. So here are some data, some kinematic data for comparison. So this is the BML exercise. This is Koyama's machine, conventional machine. There's three repetitions here. Uh, the green line represents the minimum position of the weight stack. Uh, the negative velocity means the weight was moving down, so weight moving up, weight moving down. And then here is the force that's being applied by the hands to the machine. So this is the BML device and the conventional machine. So there are a few things that are obvious to you, those of you who are used to looking at such traces. First of all, you can see the BML exercise is much more rhythmic. It's the same load, 30% of 1RM. But most importantly for him, note here that between in the middle of the repetitions, the force goes to almost zero in the BML machine, and this is due to his gear uh, system. Whereas on the conventional machine, the, uh, it never goes to zero, which means that when you are lowering the load and the muscle is being stretched, you're doing a lengthening contraction. When you're on the Koyama machine and the muscle is being stretched, you relax. There's no lengthening contraction. So he characterizes uh, uh, exercises in the following way. So this is the scheme for the lat pull-down exercise. So this is um, lowering the load. So here's the load here. The arms and hands are going to be raised. The load will be lowered. Um, and these are the actions during the lowering phase. You can see the change in load. The peaks here, and here's the force applied by the subject to the load. And this is what the EMG activity indicates that the muscles are doing. During the lowering phase, the muscles are relaxed here on a BML machine, but not on a conventional machine. And so at just before the, the reversal of the movement, the muscles are activated in the form of lengthening contraction, 
which is why he calls it beginning movement load training. Here's the movement here, and the load is applied just before the beginning of the movement. So we recruited 24 older adults who participated in an eight-week BML training program. They used seven BML machines, all designed by Toyama, four for the upper body and three for the lower body. The training load was 30% of 1RM. Uh, we assessed functional performance with chair rise time, one leg balance, and stair climbing. And the subjects also performed steady contractions, which lasted 10 seconds, uh, with the elbow flexors and the knee flexors at 10, 30, and 65% of MVC force. This diagram shows the machines that we use, one for the anterior chest muscles, one for the arm muscles, a dip exercise, a pullover exercise for the shoulder and anterior chest muscles. These are upper bodies and then on the lower body, uh, an outer thigh rotation, an inner thigh rotation, and a leg press exercise in addition to the lat pull down. So none of these exercises engage the elbow flexor muscles. This one over here did engage the knee extensors and the leg extensor muscles. And the changes in strength were the following. There were no statistically significant changes in elbow flexor strength for either the BML training group or the control group, but the knee extensor muscles became a strength increase <coughs> by 20 to 30% at four and eight weeks by doing these BML exercises. With the load, I might remind you, is 30% of maximum. Furthermore, steadiness improved. So we have measures of steadiness for the elbow flexor muscles, the knee extensor muscles, this is the normalized measurement of steadiness at three different target courses. The training group is in field symbols and the control group in open circuits. And all of these measurements, steadiness improved. So the big question is, what about function? How did this influence function? So here are the four function measurements. They're ascent, descent, chair rise, and balance. And what you see is that at week four, chair rise time improved, balance time improved, and at eight, week eight, all four measures improved. So what we were interested in, which of our outcome measures could predict these changes in performance? So we did a multiple regression analysis for the chair rise time, none of the measurements that we made contributed significantly to the change in chair rise time. For the, uh, the R squared values were moderate for stair ascent, descent, and balance, and these are the predictive variables. One measurement of strength, and all the others were measurements of steadiness. So it seems that when you do a program like this, there is an opportunity when uh, the exercises are available <coughs> and the focus is on steadiness, you can have meaningful improvements in physical function. However, as we get older, it's not only the quality of the muscle activation signal that changes, it's also the quantity. So the story that I've tried to convey to you today is that in middle age when we begin to feel things changing, I think we need to think more seriously about the quality of the activation signal because changes are clearly taking place there before <coughs> there are any significant declines in strength. But once we get into our older years, we both have both the adaptation and the quality, but we also have significant changes in the quantity. <coughs> and I want to share with you some data from one study in which we have tried to estimate how substantial are these changes in older adults in the quantity of muscle activity when they're asked to perform certain tasks. So to, uh, to, to share these data with you, I need to explain quite briefly a simple uh, fatigability measurement that we use. Uh, in this project here, in this protocol, subjects are seated and we're interested in measuring the fatigability of the elbow flexor muscle. So they sit here, the arm is in a, an orthosis, it's rigidly attached to a force transducer, they contract the elbow flexor muscles, which exerts an upward force at the wrist. This force can be displayed on the monitor of the subject, and the target force established, a submaximal force, say 20%, and the task of the subject is to maintain that submaximal force for as long as possible. We compare that measure of fatigability 
with a companion task in which the same muscles are involved, the person and the arm is in the same position, but now instead of that limb being rigidly clamped to the force transducer, we have this very sophisticated loading system where we add weights into the, the mass here and the subjects and the load that's in here is exactly the same as that force. So now the torque being produced by the elbow flexor muscles is identical in the two conditions. And, but the feedback under this condition now is elbow angle. And elbow angle shown on the monitor and the task to the subject is please hold that joint angle for as long as you can. And when you ask subjects to do this, they will tell you this is much more difficult than this, even though the net muscle torque is the same. And here are some typical data to indicate that. So we have endurance time for the force task, the easier task, relative to endurance time for the position task, up for 16 subjects. And the line of identity here indicates the two subjects, endurance time is identical for the two tasks, but for most subjects, the, the endurance time was longer for the force task, and on average here, the endurance time was twice as long for the force task as it was for the position task, even though it's the same muscle and they're generating the same muscle torque. So we decided to use this observation to compare uh, how young and old adults and how they perform these two tasks. And our approach was quite different from anything that we've ever done before, and we decided to quantify the spatial distribution of muscle activity by using uh, PET measurements. And if you're not familiar with these measurements, you can infuse certain substances, lab labeled substances, uh, and these are taken up by various tissues, and there are algorithms by which you can, uh, you can calculate how much of the labeled compound has been taken up. So our protocol looked like this. The subjects came uh, for three sessions, and they were, we were interested in testing the fatigability of the knee extensor muscles for young and old adults, uh, located in this position here, and they were asked to sustain a force that was 25% of maximum, either pulling against this rigid restraint or supporting this load. And when supporting the load here, the target was the knee angle. So in the first session, they came and they did this task, the position task, for as long as possible. So we wanted to determine the endurance time for the position task. Then on the next two sessions, they came and they did uh, this task to 90% of the endurance time for the position task, but they either did the force task in one session or the position task in the other session in a randomized order. So the fatigue task was performed for exactly the same duration for each person. Uh, soon after the fatiguing contraction began, we infused a labeled analog of glucose, FEG, which is taken up by active tissues. And then at this time point, 90% of failure time, they were moved very quickly to a PET CT scanner so that we could obtain changes to measure uh, uh, the spatial distribution of this huge compound. So the images look like this. So here's the CT scan, which enables us to, to identify the anatomy of the muscles that we're interested in, and the PET image looks like this. So each, for each muscle, we identify a region of interest, measure the intensity of the PET signal, which is an index of glucose uptake, and then relate that to the anatomy that we've observed. So here are some whole lower body scans for an old man looking at the front and the back, and for a young man, the front and the back. Here are the quadriceps muscle. And signal intensity is greatest, meaning there's more of the compound is taken up in the bright areas. So red here, uh, the uh, label glucose was taken up into the bladder in very high levels. But also, if you just look at the quadriceps here in the old man compared with the young man, it appears at least visually that there are some significant differences. So in the, in the analysis, we did a voxel by voxel uh, calculation of signal intensity in the identified muscles, and we did this for 24 leg muscles, and this was the net result. So in this index is the standardized uptake value of the glucose uh, uh, compound for young adults and old adults, for the forced task and the more difficult position task, 
for both the young and the old. And remember now that both of these fatiguing compressions <coughs> were performed for exactly the same duration. So for this more difficult task, when the net muscle force was the same, the net muscle torque was the same, the young adults took up more labeled glucose during the position task at the same absolute time compared with the force task. So there was a load effect for the young adults, but not <coughs> for the old adults. It didn't matter to them that there was a difference in the type of load, the amount of glucose taken up was not statistically different. But what was most important for our observation was that the, the amount of glucose taken up by the old men was statistically much greater than that by the young men. Young men. So to perform the same task, the same relative fatigue and contraction, the old men, the old men took up involved more muscles. And when we look at how this was distributed across the different muscle groups, we see this load effect here for the young men the extensors, the knee flexors, the hip muscles, but not for the lower leg, and there was no load effect for the old men. So, what can we conclude from these observations? Eight weeks of BML training improved strength and steadiness during isometric contractions with the elbow flexors and knee extensors. BML training elicited significant association between gains on three functional parts and improvements in steadiness, which I interpret as a as a measure of the quality of muscle activation signal. And finally, older adults use greater quantities of muscle activity to perform the same tasks, same relative tasks, as young adults. So that's my story, and the key points that I would like to leave you with today are that the greater declines in daily levels of physical activity exhibited by girls during the onset of the puberty is associated with lesser development of muscle strength and endurance leg muscles and an increase in body fat, and declines in physical function emerged during middle age prior to substantial losses in muscle strength. And finally, physical function in older adults can be augmented by, muscles, by exercises that involve actions about multiple degrees of freedom with modest loads. The end.